Hi everyone, this is Heather Lottenen from the Flourish Academy. It's time for our weekly q and I'm gonna start with a question from Charlie. I have my laptop over here, that's why I am looking, in case you're wondering. She says, Heather, have you ever had a bad review or had someone post a horrible review about you or your business? If so, how did you handle it? Thankfully, Charlie, in 15 years, I've not had that happen. I am very grateful and thankful for that. But I've had a few friends that have had really bad, really negative reviews left about them in a variety of places. One is Google reviews. The other is The Knot and Wedding Wire. Now, in all of these cases, I happen to know these photographers personally. They are outstanding artists and they are fantastic people and these reviews my opinion is that they were unfounded and the reason I know in particular that one of these reviews was unfounded is because the person leaving the review actually two cases the people leaving the reviews had never even used the photographer so they go on to someone's Google business review and write something negative about this person and they're not even a client that's a problem. Okay, so they, the reason I know about this is because they came to me and asked for, for my advice. All right, in the case where it was not a real client, I encouraged them to contact Google, or I think one of them may have even been on Wedding Wire, and explain the situation and see if you can get the review removed. In, in any case, whether it's a legitimate review or not, I would suggest publicly replying to that review. So I would say, you know, in the case where the person had never even hired the photographer, I would say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I don't think that we've met. I don't believe you're a client of mine. Is there anything I can do to help you? Or if it is a client of yours, then I would reply and say, I'd love to help you resolve this issue. Uh, let's chat or something along those lines. You usually cannot get reviews removed. Now, I don't know about these ones that were unsubstantiated, but it's really difficult to get them removed. I know in one particular case, a client went out of her way to bash a photographer, and it was very awful and challenging, and the photographer is not able to get it removed, but she was able to reply, and she was able to sort things out with the client privately. Okay, what can you do here to protect yourself from this happening? Number one is do everything you can to create the best possible, possible customer experience. And obviously customer service is at the very top of that. Do what you say you're gonna do, say, be where you say you're gonna be, deliver when you say you're gonna deliver. All of those things are really important. When it does happen, I would reply super, super professionally. Now, I have had negative reviews on my YouTube videos and usually I will reply and thank them for their feedback. If it's appropriate, I'll make changes. I had a person reply and yell at me to use a mic. Okay, I'm using a mic, he was right. I needed a mic on these videos. I'm not always able to use a mic because of where I'm at, but when I can, I will try to shoot for better audio. Some people on YouTube will just post comments because maybe they're bored, I'm not sure. But if it's something silly, which does happen, I will thank them for their feedback and I will encourage them to enjoy the rest of the free content on my channel. And I will do it with a smile. I hope that helps. Christine says, hi Heather, I do in-person sales. Right now, they look at their session on my computer and they favorite the pictures that they like. So far, so good. I then have them tell, many, tell me how many prints of each they would want along with sizes. I feel like I could have a better workflow as this seems a little time consuming to me. How do people <coughs> present a photo session to their clients using in-person sales? Thank you for all of your hard work that you put into the community. I have learned so much. Yeah, that is probably not the best approach. You might wanna look into some type of software. Okay, you can do this in Lightroom, but I'm actually gonna defer this question to my friend Mara and also Val Thomas because they both do in-person sales and they both do it very well and extremely efficiently. So I will make a note, Christine, to talk to Mara via an interview and we'll go over this a little bit more 
it's a little bit beyond my particular scope and um, I think that we just need to bring somebody in who does in-person sales on a regular basis. So we'll, we'll get to that, thank you. Stacy says, I have a Lightroom 6 on my computer. I export my images into folders on my external hard drive. Good, okay. I would like to free up space on my internal hard drive. Is there a way to export a whole year's catalog onto an external drive device? Is this a good idea? What do you do to keep your Lightroom catalogs slim? Thanks for all you do. I love watching your videos. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Okay, number one is moving forward. I would like you to create your catalogs on your external drives along with your photos. So my catalogs live where their friends live, the photos on the external drive. Okay, but that's not what you're dealing with here. What you're dealing with is internally, you must have your catalogs on your C or your D drive, your operating system drive, and you need to get that off of there for sure. You can export a catalog. I'm thinking you could probably just even move the catalog without even exporting it and Lightroom will be able to hook everything back up. But either way, yes, is it possible? Absolutely. But the next part of that question is how do I keep my catalogs slim? I create two new catalogs per year, one for clients and one for personal. So I only have one catalog per year. I don't have any big giant catalogs. False, negative, I do. I have an archived catalog from when I very first started shooting digital, which was 1999. I had a Sony Mavica that took a floppy disk. I have those photos from 1999 through 2005, I believe, personal photos in one big catalog and it seems to be fine. But then I started breaking it up per year. So one catalog for clients, one catalog for personal per year, lives in my external hard drive. I have several videos on the Flourish Academy blog for Lightroom and slowness. If you just type in Lightroom slow in the search bar, you'll find a few videos, some things that you can do to speed up Lightroom, but also you wanna get everything off of your internal drive. Now, if the catalogs are living on your internal drive, then so are the previews, so are all of your backup catalogs. So you want to get that stuff moved. You want to purge your Clearview cache and make sure that those photos are not just sitting on your hard drive. So again, that's outlined in the videos. So you can take a look at those videos, clean everything up, move those catalogs. They should live on your external hard drive with their friends, the photos, and then everything's nice and neat. Hope that helps. Stacy also asks, what was more beneficial to you? a workshop or a portfolio review? That's a good question. What was more, I'm looking up something. Uh, I wanna see what video. I had an episode recently where I talked about a workshop that included portfolio reviews. It is episode, episode, I'm not sure. I should have, I should have known this. We're on episode 250, 60 <laughs> something, and I can't remember which one it is. Oh, episode 272, where I talk about receiving feedback. But your question is, is it more beneficial to attend a workshop or to get a portfolio review? And the answer to that question is yes. Both are really important and you need to do both. Nothing beats a workshop where you are connected with other creative professionals, nothing. That shared experience, working together, getting new ideas is priceless. So I definitely encourage you to do that, however, I know that you are in a particular season with very small children and babies that makes that a little bit challenging. In terms of a portfolio review, that is super simple and straightforward. Everyone should do it. I have an option in the Flourish Academy where you can submit either your website, your portfolio, or and or your Facebook page, and I record a video where I detail some ideas for your photos, maybe for your marketing. Um, you can request exactly what you're looking for, but so people will submit that to me, 
I will record a video and explain how they can improve their photographs or improve their website or their Facebook page and then I ship that video over to them so that they can watch it, have it, and refer to it. Personally, I think everyone should do that. It's inexpensive, it's an easy way to start to look at your photos and get some advice on improvement then yes, you should look at workshops and see what you can attend. Now I talked about the feedback in that episode because some people are a little bit or a lot <laughs> sensitive to that feedback. I try to approach it with a loving heart and a serving manner to help you improve your images. But if you are an extremely sensitive person, then submitting your work for feedback may not be for you. If you just want affirmation on how awesome you are, then just call your mom and she'll tell you. But if you want to improve your work, then submit your website, your photos, your Facebook page to the Flourish Academy for a portfolio review. I will record a video and get that back to you and let you know how you can improve. Now, I used to do this, and, and to some degree, I still do in private mentoring sessions. Clients will come to me, we'll talk about it. And you know what I found with those sessions is that I'll ask them, how do you receive feedback? We'll start to look at the photos and I'll say, okay, this photo looks good because of this, but here's what you could do to make it better. And every single time, every single person, the first words out of their mouth when I say, hey, you might wanna, um, you might wanna like move this person a little bit this way or turn your angle, they will say to me, well, I couldn't because that's where the client wanted the photo. Or they'll say, well, I'll say something about the light and they'll say the client wanted it at noon or this was the client's location or, well, it was raining that day. Well, there was traffic and I didn't have options. Okay, every word that comes out of your mouth, every word is an excuse as to why you couldn't have made that photo better. And when you do that, it puts you in this victim mindset. So sometimes I'll say to people, they'll say, well, I, you know, I'm looking at the lake right now and there are docks and maybe a client wanted a photo on the dock but the lighting is terrible. So the client goes out there, you take the photo, and then I say to you, hey, the lighting is terrible. And you say, well, the client wanted a photo on the dock, to which I say, oh my gosh, you were a victim. You were a victim of a photography lighting incident. No, okay, take the photo on the dock, but then change something and make it better. I'm all about pleasing the client, and if they want the photo, I will take the photo, but maybe that's not the one that's gonna really represent my art or that I'm gonna submit for feedback. But, so I decided, I used to do these portfolio reviews online, and so you could be anywhere, you don't have to be in my area, and we would talk it through, and every single photo, I try to give some sort of constructive criticism. Hey, and by the way, not all photos need it. Some are just great, it's an awesome photo. But every one I do, every single person will have an excuse as to why they didn't get a better photo. Excuses don't make you get better. And then they'll say to me, well, you know, I just did my best. I did my best, that's what I had to work with, I did my best. False, you can always do better. That's what I tell my kids. Don't tell me you're doing your best, you could always do better. Am I doing my best? Negative, I could always do better. You can always look for a better way to approach something. So <laughs> rather than do these portfolio reviews online or over the phone, where I listen to a myriad of reasons as to why this photo wasn't good, I've decided that I'm just going to record them and then you can take it and you can make your excuses all you want. I'm not <laughs> saying everyone does that, but pretty close to every photo I go through, someone will say, no, I couldn't do that because, 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 because. And then I say, okay, I understand you're a victim. I understand you couldn't make it better. Now listen, there are some times, depending on what type of photographer you are, you are documenting an event and you have to document what's there. Well, that's really not a reflection on you as an artist, is it? So if you want some critique about maybe how to pose or composition or the art, then submit those photos. Uh, I got off on a little bit of a tangent there. Forgive me, both are important. <laughs> Gina says, tell me more about Trello. She's saying this because I mentioned it in a previous video. What do you use it for? How do you use it? What are you reading now? Do you have any ongoing list, podcast list somewhere? 
Okay, a bunch of questions. Number one, Trello is a collaboration tool. My friend Nicole Begley and I use it. We've used it for years in order to work on projects together and collaborate. You have access to it, you create boards and you create lists, you can assign tasks, you can see who's working on what. Essentially, a project management tool. But a lot of people use it for a lot of really unique things and I've expanded the way I use it. I have several boards they're called with lists. So for instance, I have a board called Free Content Ideas. Inside of that board, I have several lists. So I have a Lightroom list, I have a Photoshop, I have a miscellaneous, I have business, all different types of lists. And whenever I think of something or I see one of you asking a question, then I capture that in the, in the Trello board in that list so that when I am in need of content to generate, I can go to that list, see what everybody's talking about, and just grab it. It's just a way to organize and create. I also have um, a board called Ideas and Exploration. So I use that board in order to capture workshops that I'm interested in, or possibly books or education I would like to explore. I love Trello. And one of my favorite things to do when I have a moment okay, this is bigger than just Trello, is invest in my education. So I'll, I'll go on YouTube and search for how are people using Trello because you can always get new ideas and you think, oh my gosh, I hadn't thought of that. And Mar and I use it to collaborate. We love Trello. You could probably use it. Um, I use it for private mentoring clients. So maybe as a photographer, you could use it for clients to track certain things. It is awesome. I love it. Okay, what am I reading now, you ask me? Well, I just finished Big Potential by Sean Acor, and I loved it. I devoured this book. I recommended it to Mara. She had it read in a day. Look at all these notes. So good. It is everything the Flourish Academy stands for, which is working within a community and a team so that we all grow together. It, oh my gosh, cannot say enough good things about this book. Pick this one up, Big Potential, love it. And I just started Successful Women Think Differently by Valerie Burton, and I love her. I love her, Valerie, I love you, you are amazing. I read, what, she has several books. Let me see if they're listed here. And I read one of them last year, and I decided at that point that I would probably read every book she writes. I love her style of writing. It's very straightforward, easy to read, actionable strategies. I believe she's a life coach, which I, I have my certification in life coaching, so I can relate. And she's also Christian-based and biblical, which I love. So, Valerie, I love you. Thank you. Okay, podcast. You had said, Gina, that you were in a podcast rut and you needed some ideas. Okay. I want to tell you guys something. You know how I love to read these books? You know how I read like a gazillion books? I have the list on the website. I have a page dedicated to all of the books I read. I have my favorites list. I love it. I know that all of you do not have the time to read all of these books. I devour them. My goal is one book a week. It's been that way for at least 10 years. That's about 50 books a year for 10 years. That is so awesome. But I know you don't have time. So Mar and I are starting a podcast where we go through these books and you can listen to the podcast and we break it down if you don't have time to read the book. Then if you're interested because you heard it on the podcast and it's something you would like to learn more about, then obviously you could pick up the book and read it. And last week, listen to this, last week Mara came over in this studio that I've built in the basement and we recorded our first eight episodes. It will be launching in March, so keep an eye out for that. Hopefully that will get you out of your podcast rut. It's her and I talking about the books. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree. The episodes are all going to be really short between probably 20 and 25 minutes. So good, I think that you're gonna love it. Okay, but in the meantime, the podcast that I'm listening to currently, I love anything Dave Ramsey. So any um, Entree Leadership or Christy Wright, The Business Boutique, love those. I love Donald Miller, Building a Story Brand. That's something I listen to all the time. But lately, I am obsessed with my best friend, Jocko. 
he does not know that we are best friends, Jocko Podcast. Jocko is a Navy SEAL. You know I love the Navy SEALs. I got into them a few years ago when I read Living with a SEAL by Jesse Itzler and then Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willick and Leif Babin. I love him. He is so hardcore. Ah, it's fantastic. Okay, his podcasts are obviously you can listen to it on any podcast player, but he also has the videos on YouTube, which is what I watch when I'm on the treadmill every day. His podcasts are like three hours long, definitely long form, but I just love it. And I, in fact, while I'm here, Craig told me that I got my t-shirt from Jocko. It says discipline equals freedom. That's a new book of his that I've read. I love it. He's coming out, him and Leif are coming out with another book this fall. I will read it the minute it hits the shelves. He is absolutely my favorite. But listen, if you're not into hardcore training and discipline, and I don't, I'm not talking about physical training, I'm talking about the mental game, then it may not be for you. But while I've been here in Deep Creek, I get up every day at 5 a.m. so I can get after it. And I have been doing really well with this Jocko mentality. But again, that might not be for everyone. I don't listen to any podcasts for fun per se. Le no, I, let me rephrase for leisure, it's all fun to me. I love to work, I work every minute of every day. I worked yesterday from 5 a.m. until about 7.30 p.m. and loved every minute of it. And while I've been here, frequent exercise breaks because you can't just sit and work for that long, it's not worked to me. In fact, one of my friends said to me, are you really gonna work while you're in Deep Creek? And I'm like, um, have we met? I love my work and I work all the time. Uh, but according to my watch, I got in all my exercise minutes the past several days. So what I've done is I work these stretches and then I exercise. I'm getting off on a tangent, but this is all because I'm super hyper focused. Where do you get that kind of focus from? Well, it's about understanding your goals, your vision, your dreams, what your purpose is, what your work is about. I'm really connected with that. And I love the Jocko podcast. Um, let me know if you start reading these Navy SEALs books or watching these videos. Oh, get after it. Okay, Marie says, hi Heather, I'm still working on my website. What is the ideal file size for the photos on the site to maximize resolution but decrease load time? Also, I've already exported the photos I'd like to use on the site from Lightroom. Can I adjust the file size after the fact? If so, how do you recommend? Or should I use Lightroom to adjust the file size before exporting? I have Photoshop, but I tried to avoid it unless absolutely necessary. Okay, uh, as a side note, Marie, you would love Photoshop. So just invest some time in learning it and you will love it. Can you adjust the file size after you've in exported from Lightroom? Well, sure you can. If you take it into Photoshop or if you use something like JPEG Mini, which Leanne uses and loves because it compresses the JPEG, makes the file size smaller, but still retains the quality. So that's something to look into. However, of course, I've created my own. I have a Photoshop action that resizes the file. Negative. I don't resize in Photoshop. I compress it. So, it's an, so you would want to have the size you would want for your website coming out of Lightroom. Okay, this sounds like it's getting convoluted. Let me back up and say this. In order to export for your website, yes, you should resize the longest side, whether that is landscape or portrait, the longest size for your website depends on your website layout. So for instance, it might be something as small as 800 pixels, but it could be upwards of 2000 pixels, depending on how you have your layout set up. So I think on the Flourish Academy blog, I have my photos set to 800 pixels on the long side, whether that is landscape or portrait, whatever the long side is. And I do that out of Lightroom. You can export that out of Lightroom. Okay, but then there's also JPEG compression and quality settings. So you can turn the quality settings down to say around 80%. You can put that at 72 PPI. It's not for print, it doesn't matter. And that will create a very small size, file size. Your question was, what is an ideal file size? Well, it's probably less than 500 kilobytes. So you would wanna see 500K or less on these photos. Every once in a while, I have a photo that's hovering around 800K. Okay, that's not the end of the world, but smaller is definitely better. I can compress these JPEGs through my Photoshop action. Maybe I should do a video on this. I'll add it to my Trello board, but I can get those file sizes down to a couple hundred K or even less. 
the smaller, the better, especially over time. Think of this, weddingsbyheather.com has almost 15 years of content. That's insane. And I didn't always do a good job at this back in the day, but now I do a better job and I've had to purchase more space with GoDaddy. But anyway, keep them as small as you can. Yes, th there are a lot of questions there. The maximum resolution decrease load time. 800 to 1000 on the long side, 72 PPI, doesn't matter because it's not for print and 80% quality out of Lightroom and how should I do this well I have my own workflow that I just outlined you could use JPEG mini that's really good for compression Leanne uses it and loves it so definitely check that out I'm just trying to see if there's a better way to help you with what you've currently done if you've already exported from Lightroom, the only way to adjust the files after the fact is Photoshop or JPEG Mini, unless you wanna go back and export again from Lightroom. By the way, exporting again from Lightroom will only take you about 5.2 seconds. Select all of the files that you wish to upload. I use filters in order to grab the files that I want for the website. A six on my keyboard, red, I change that to website, blog, I call it. But you export all of those at once, you just have to change the export dialogue settings. It wouldn't take you long at all. Okay, Julie asks, in Lightroom, how do the first highlights, shadows, whites, blacks, sliders, and I think she's talking about the ones in the basic panel, how do those differ from the tone curve where the highlights, lights, darks, and shadows are. They seem so similar, but it seems like people tweak both. What's the difference of the two? Okay, this is interesting. At a high level, they both do very similar things. And for a lot of people, it's two different vehicles to get you to the same destination. Okay, but the truth is, the highlights and shadows sliders in the basic panel have masking built into them so that it only impacts certain tonalities of say the histogram. So for instance, if you have shadows in the basics panel and you move the shadows slider, Lightroom will only impact shadows. That is, it will mask out highlights. It's using a masking algorithm so that it doesn't impact highlights, just shadows. The tone curve, does not do that. So no masking in the tone curve. When you're using the tone curve, any of those sliders are being applied to the entire image, all tonalities, all ranges. So that's the main difference. It sounds complicated, it's not. Think of it like this. In the basic panel, it's only impacting, only the highlights, shadows, highlights, shadows, whites and blacks, only impacting those areas of tonality in the histogram. In the tone curve, it's impacting the entire image because there's no masking built in. I think you've, you've been working with this for a long time. I think that will make sense to you, but for anyone who's new, if you have any questions, let me know and I'll try to address it. Marie posted for Boudoir Photographers. She said, how do you back up your images? I'm not a Boudoir Photographer but do it for a few close friends and obviously want to keep their images safe, obviously. Probably overanalyzing, but I want to use a super secure backup service besides my external hard drives. I used to photograph a ton of boudoir and that's Mara's main business right now. And when anyone ever says, how secure is something on the internet? I mean, nothing is secure on the internet. Yes, you can have secure services, but don't put anything on the internet that you wouldn't ever want to see the light of day. Anybody, anyone, anything, anytime, any computer system can hack into anything. It can happen. I mean, if they, the Russians, have you heard of the Russians? I mean, they breach super, super secure banking vault type websites. Uh, the dark web people, yikes, they can do anything. So is anything super, super, super secure on the internet? Negative, how could it be? So 
if you're really concerned about this, I wouldn't back these files up to the interwebs. I wouldn't do it. I would keep them on a couple external hard drives, maybe two, maybe you have a Drobo with some type of RAID 5 array where it's spread across several drives. But if you're really concerned about it, then I would only keep them locally. That's the only way to be super, super secure about it. I hope that that helps. Do you guys have any other questions? I'm not sure if I'm seeing comments on the video. So forgive me if you're saying something. I'm not, I don't see it. There are comments. Okay, Kathy says, I love the book Extreme Ownership. I recommend the book to employees that I mentor at my regular job. Yes, Extreme Ownership. Get ready to get ready and get after it. I loved it. Okay, I'm looking at these comments now on my laptop because they're not they're not appearing in the live video. Oh, Marie says, thanks, that helped. That's what I did, multiple externals. Yeah, that's what I would do. Uh, oh, Robbie says, I need to start using Trello. Yeah, you do, Robbie, because I created a board for you. <laughs> so I have a collaboration board, Flourish Academy YM Camera, that I invited Robbie to so that we could coordinate on free content ideas for the classes that I teach at YM. So definitely get on it. Um, oh, Mandy says, I love workshops, but here's a major tip. Do your research on the workshop. They can oftentimes be pricey. Make sure they are legit. Otherwise, it's money down the drain. Speaking from unfortunate experience. And I actually have several mentoring clients like Mandy that have had this unfortunate experience of signing up for a workshop that was a lot of hype and not a lot of content. Be very careful, look for reviews, talk to people who have attended the workshop and they'll tell you whether it was worth it or not. Be careful before you spend thousands of dollars. Oh, Amber says she needs to do a portfolio website review. That sounds awesome. Amber, submit it. I'll create a video for you and um, hopefully it will help. So I'm about to wrap up my time here at Deep Creek. I've been here all week. I have been working like crazy. Yesterday, I did 15 screencasts for Lightroom and Photoshop for the upcoming free content on the YouTube channel. Oh my goodness, that is unheard of. So I had planned it out in my Trello board. I had everything ready and I just went to town and all day screencasted. It is so awesome. You know why? Because that's 15 weeks worth of, worth of free content going out on YouTube. Hey, by the way, I have hundreds of videos on YouTube. If you're looking for something in particular, go search in the Flourish Academy blog because they're all linked up there and you can usually find what you're looking for. And if I haven't created it, let me know. And by the way, while you're enjoying all of this free content, when we do offer presets or workshops, and you're interested, we would love if you would purchase them because that helps support all of this free content. I hope you have a great day. I'll see you in the next video.